Again, you're probably wondering why I record this. That's so if I record you when you do your presentations, then everyone is treated the same, right? I record myself, I record you, that's fine. Now, we want to focus on the second part of here. What I've got is some handouts, which is focusing on the learning objectives of today's course. If you can hand these out, that would be fantastic. Here's what we want to cover today. That's focused on the tutorial work and an extension of what we did last week. I want to cover the learning outcome number six, seven, and eight. Number six is making you aware, you probably are aware of it, customer response time and explain why delays happen and their costs. Okay, we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the theory of constraints. And finally, we're going to look at how to manage bottlenecks. How many of you are comfortable with this framework here? Hands up. Okay. What is the big pick, what is the big takeaway of this? If so so for example you go in for an internship interview and they say, oh, okay, so you're doing management accounting too. Ah, yeah, I know that professor. Mm, he's okay teacher. All right, but so what, what are you learning? Okay, what are you gonna say about this? Well, last week I learned, what? What was the big thing to take away from this last week? What was the big idea? Yes, that was, the, that was the big idea. All right, if you want to get attention of C managers, when we say C managers, right, CEO, CFO, CIO, then you need to use financials, why? Right? Because they answer to their stakeholders in terms of what? Financials, okay? So they know that language, okay? You, you tell them non-financial, then they'll say, okay, what does that mean financially? Okay, you're going to have to translate it somehow. All right. So given that, how do you actually manage initiatives in your, in your organisation? Or what if you were asked to put the balance scorecard in place? Are you going to say, mm, oh, the C managers, they don't care about non-financials, so let's not waste time doing that, okay? All right? Okay, that's true in some sense. They're just going to pay attention to the financials, right? But you need to be an advocate for the value and partly the limitations of non-financial. I guess that's what, that's the second takeaway you need to have, okay? Be an advocate for non-financial. Understand, don't just say, oh, forget about non-financial, rubbish, okay? How many of you listened or were in a class on Tuesday when the lighting case study was presented. How many of you witnessed that presentation? How many of you did not hear the presentation on the lighting case where the balance scorecard failed? Okay, what, did it fail because of the financial? No, it failed because of the, the non-financial. Okay, and then you're probably thinking after Tuesday, oh, O'Connor stitches the balance scorecard and Man, everything I look at now, it's failure, all right? So another takeaway may be, oh, forget our balance scorecard because non-financials don't work, okay? Okay, that's a very shallow summary of what the situation is, okay? I want you to appreciate the non-financials a little bit more deeply than that, okay? in the following ways. Number one, yes, non-financials do not get the attention of the C major. Right, right correct. Yes, non-financial measures have limitations. And you know from their case what the limitations are, right? They may be subjective, 
they may cause information what overload okay yes all right and they're the two main problems subjectivity and information overload okay so what do you throw them out no one of the takeaways from last week is why don't we use the non-financial for helping us to achieve other objectives maybe we can't use non-financials directly for allocating bonus Maybe we can't do that, but we still can use it for getting feedback on other initiatives. So last week we talked about if we're going to put in some new quality control initiative, maybe, remember at the end of last week we had one big problem, do we spend money on prevention or appraisal, right? So we can hire more inspectors to solve our quality problem. Or we can spend more money on new machines, new engineering, you with me? Two approaches to deal, and then you look at, well, do we do A or B? Sort of like a make or buy type thing, something, a decision, okay? Just a side note, that's, that's a really good, you, all of you should know that very, very well, because it might be in the exam. Now, considering those two decisions, whether you put money into appraisal or money into prevention, some of those, we try to use financial, but at some point in time, we're trying to put, make some assumptions about the opportunity costs of avoiding failure, okay? Then it becomes subjective anyway. So the financials are still limited in some ways. Then you choose one or the other, you make the decision, oh, we're going to spend more money on appraisal. Okay, let's do more on appraisal. Ah, but you know from your balance scorecard game that we can do two things. One, we can have more inspectors, or we can train our inspectors to be what? Let me repeat. You learn from your balance scorecard game that in solving a HR problem, you can spend more money on hiring more, what? Inspectors, yes. Or you can do what? You can spend more money on training your current inspectors, right? What You know what happened in the game if you did one or the other, right? You need to have some balance, okay? All right, so same thing. You can decide to do that. And so if you spend more time on training, maybe you need some feedback. Are we getting some feedback from the training we're putting in? So then that's where non-financial measures can give you that feedback on that initiative. Okay? So you spend 50,000, 100,000, get consultants in to come in and train the inspectors, make them better, uh, train them in terms of the latest quality control initiatives. Okay? Well then you need feedback. You, you invest this money in training are you getting an improvement from the training? So, non-financial measures, the point from last week is, they're useful in giving you feedback on the initiatives, initial feedback. Are you going in the right direction? Are you allocate money into this initiative, what's happening? Because the financials may take a long time. They may take one quarter, six months, to materialize as a feedback mechanism. All right, so in a nutshell, financials is all that matters. Right? The C majors. But non financials, yes, subjective, yes, information overload, but they can be useful given feedback for the initiatives. Okay? So you need, I want, you've got to be in an interview or you're in a major position, try and be, be realistic but be practical about the balance scorecard. Be practical, right? manager asks you, what do you think? Oh, it's rubbish. Okay? That's not help. That doesn't help. Right? That's not a risk that's not a professional response. That's not a practical response. It's not a real response. Okay? You gotta give reasons, okay? If you believe that, then this is the reason why, okay? But you've got to see both sides, alright? So that was last week.
That was last week, the big takeaways from last week. So what about this week? This week is about competing on time. What do we want to compete on time? Let me show you. Let's have a look at Remember, we're in a big system here, all right? So we're over, we're over here, okay? We're still finishing off on the internal. Okay, time is a crucial element of the value chain. Yes, and decreasing non-value at a time goes hand with increasing quality. That's what we want. Now, time is a competitive act element. Let me ask you, how long does it take to make a car? How many of you have... Okay, let me practice presenting for your case studies, okay? So I'm asking you a question now, all right? So do I ask a broad question or a narrow question? Broad question. Okay, always broad. So how many of you have ridden inside a car? Put your hand up. Okay, everyone puts their hand up, right? So, okay. All right, how many of you have driven a car? Okay, a few. How many of you have been to a car factory? No one. Okay, so you never ask that question first, right? Okay. All right, so you know what a car is, but you haven't been to a car factory. Now, the next question is, how long do you think it takes to make a car? I want you to write down how many hours does it take, or how many days, or how many months. Write it down now, please. Quick. Come on, speed thinking. 19, 18, 17. Come on, you've got 16 seconds. Write down a number now. Days, months, hours, minutes, 11, 10. Write down a number now, please. 7, 6, 5. Have you written down a number? Just think of your birthday if that's, you can't think of another number, all right? Just write it down. Okay, two, one. Hands up if you think it takes six months to make a cut. Okay, you've got three hands. Great, okay, we've got a starting point. Hands up if you think it takes longer than six months to make a cut. Okay, shorter than six months. Okay, good, everyone else must put their hand up. Great, all right, so. What about anyone between three and six months? Okay, shorter than three months. Okay, all right, what about between one month and three months? Okay, shorter than one month. Okay, let's talk about weeks now. Uh, less than 10 weeks. Okay, good. All right, what about less than one week? Less than one week. How, how many of you think it takes longer than a week to make a car? Okay, all right, good. I need to take you to a car factory. All right, okay. All right, okay, so let's talk about days now. All right, so we're talking about less than one week, right? You're all great, it's less than one week, right? So less than seven days. Okay, more than two days. Hands up, less than two days. Okay, less than one day. Ooh, hang on, we've got one, two, three, four, five. Less than one day. Okay, you're correct. Okay, less than one day. If you go back 15 years ago, it took about 30 hours to make a car. 30 hours. 30 hours. All right? All right? 24 hours is one day. If you want to compete in car manufacturing, let me repeat, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to compete in car manufacturing, you need to start at 18 hours, okay? 18 hours is a good benchmark to work with to make a car. Wow, okay? That's what we mean competing on time. Let me give you another example. When HTC design start designing a new phone, okay, nothing exists, they're talking about it, to it hits the marketplace, how many months? 
seven months. Okay? That's what we mean by competing on time. And I told you the story. Because they're so fast, Google went to them first for the Android platform. Qualcomm went to them first so they can commercialize their Snapdragon chip, right? You know that story. I told you that before, but I just want to remind you. That's what we mean by competing on time. If you're fast, you attract others in your industry, just like what HTC did. If they were slower, maybe Google, Qualcomm, go somewhere else. Okay? But they were fast, and then they get the idea. You see? So, today's lecture, when we're talking about competing on time, yes, there's some calculations for you to do. Yes, and uh, you're going to learn about theories of constraint. But this is real. It, it really is the essence of competition today. You have to do things, what? Fast. Fast. Okay? You just have to. So that's what today's about. 18 hours. Wow. It's amazing. So when we talk about learning objective six, it's a no-brainer. Learning objective number six. We're talking about customer response time and uncertainty. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you two uncertainties that all organizations face. Two. Okay, you write you better write these down because I'm not sure they're in your notes. The first one, the first one, what do you think the two uncertainties are? Okay? I want you to write down what you think. Write down one now. I'll give you 19 seconds. 18, 17, 16, 15. What's the two uncertainties facing organisations today? Two main uncertainties. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Just one. Write one down now. Two, one. Okay, what did you come up with? Can I go to, yes? Uh, future cash flow. Future cash flow, okay, good. Yes? Huh? Competitors. Competitors, let's get a few of these down. This is very important, okay? Future cash flow, okay. Competition, okay. What do we got down the front here? Yes. Uh, customer demand. All right. Anyone else? Loud voice, please. Delivery. 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 What about delivery? So you've got commodity prices changing and all that. And I talked to the suppliers in China, you know, what are their challenges? Some of them are uncertainties about costs, exactly. Or uncertainties about political winds of change. You know, what was a, a dirt, you know, clean industry last five years, now it becomes a dirty industry, and now it's better to invest somewhere else, and things like that are changing. Right, yes, so we know there's lots of uncertainties, but they can boil down to two things. Two things, assuming that you know what you're producing. That number one is, is uncertainty of demand. Uncertainty of demand. Which is out of your control, right? So, in other words, it's uncertainty outside. You just don't know when the next order is going to come in. There could be uncertainty associated with that. The second big uncertainty is your own production uncertainty. The uncertainty of your own operations, your supply chain. 
and being able to manage that supply chain. And the suppliers would deliver on time to go into your production process and everything would run like clockwork and then you get the goods delivered when they're supposed to be delivered, right? Because you're promising customers when they demand something, we will deliver in 10 days. I talk to, how many of you know what a PCB is? A printed circuit board, all right? So, so take, you can take your iPhone and open it up and there's a PCB inside. Would any of you like to see your PCB? I've got a screwdriver here, we can open up your phone now if you're interested. Okay, maybe later, all right. Okay, <laughs> all right. So with a PCB, and you go to these PCB suppliers in the expos, and they say, oh, give us a lead time of two to three days to give you a design for your requirements, but then we need another lead time of one week to two weeks to manufacture, depending on the size of the order. So they're promising that to customers that go to these expos, and they don't even know you. They're actually put that promise out there. We promise you to deliver in this lead time. We promise to give it to you in this time, okay? But you go to other vendors, not the PCB manufacturers, but other switch gear manufacturers, the connectors, the shelves, the cases, and all of them, they don't advertise these lead times the way the PCB manufacturers. Why do you think they do that? Why do you think one group of suppliers advertise, the others don't? Which group do you think is facing more competition in terms of time competition? Hands up for the PCB suppliers. Hands up for the other suppliers. It's the PCB suppliers. They're facing time competition. So what are they doing? As part of their promotion, they've got this promise. We can deliver you in two weeks. You see? This is what time competition does to you. It, it forces you to put that in your marketing. Okay? So just be aware, there's two big, there's two big <coughs> uncertainties facing companies. Talk to HCC, what's the biggest uncertainty? Demand forecast. If we can forecast demand, we can manage the supply chain. Here's something that is not in your textbook. How many of you would like some value added in today's lecture? Put your hand up. Okay, well there's some value added. That's not in the textbook. Okay, I drew it myself with the help of Microsoft. <laughs> okay, so we have time drivers. All right. Customer demand, production uncertainty. That's your two big drivers. You have measures, customer delivery, customer response time. What do we mean by customer response time? We mean the time from a customer initiates the order until you actually deliver the order. Right, you know that. So how do you deal with this? Well, you deal with bottlenecks. You find out which parts are slowing down your whole delivery process. Is it one supplier? Is it a delivery part? Is it one machine on the production floor? Where is your bottleneck? And you've got to deal with that. Right. And then you can take action to deal with that. At the same time, you're managing expectations. What do we mean here? You're managing what your customer thinks is reasonable for you to serve them, to add value to them. Right? So, can you imagine, or can you think there's a relationship between any of these boxes? Which ones may be related? Have a look. Managing expectations and activity bottlenecks. Do you think there might be a relationship there? Think about that. Can you imagine you're a bank and you promise, you promise anyone that walks in the door will be served in 30 seconds? Put your hand up if you're interested in going to that bank. Wow. Great. So now I've created demand, right? I've created demand by doing dealing with this or dealing with this box. Which one? This one here. I've created expectations. 
And now the demand's coming in the door, I better deliver. So what's the delivery side? Here's your delivery side. And suddenly, all of you come in one morning, and I've got this promise, 30 seconds, and suddenly there are 15 customers in line, and I've just got three tellers, three customer service operators. You're not going to be very happy. We're not going to serve all of you in 30 seconds. Impossible. Okay, so my point is, there's going to be some analytics I'm going to talk about. There's some issues in doing the calculations. But in the end, it gets back to what do you tell the customer and what are you doing operationally? Try and, my point is, or the big takeaway today, in case you have an interview tomorrow and ask, oh, what did this professor teach you in management accounting two? Well, you know what he taught us today? Yesterday, this is tomorrow when you're in an interview and ask about today, but tomorrow hasn't occurred, so I'll tell you today, which will be tomorrow, yesterday. Okay, so what did the professor teach you? Well, the professor taught us that we've got to align what we tell customers with what we're capable of doing operationally. That's all. Just get some alignment. Okay, you, okay, so I'm not here to teach you marketing. You go do a course on marketing, that's fine, you go do that, right? But this is a case where marketing needs to be aligned with what you can really deliver. Because if you can't deliver, then your marketing is worthless. Then customers bad mouth you because you're not delivering on what you're promising. So that's what we mean. Here's your marketing. If you can't change this, then tell the marketing department, look, stop telling the customers these promises, all right? Just don't promise anything, okay? At least the customer's not going to be disappointed. You may have fewer coming in the door, but they're not going to be disappointed. Are you with me on that? So there must be some alignment between what you tell the customers and your management here. So let's, uh, and I don't think the chapter in the book makes that clear. Okay, so keep that in mind as you're going through the, the problems. Look, we've got customer response time, on-time performance. I already defined what customer response time is. That it is from the customer places the order over here to, to when the customer the order is delivered. Okay. Here's something I learned from the expo yesterday, visit. We're talking to one manufacturer. What is your biggest challenge? You know what? It's trade financing. Trade financing. Because they may have to invest half a million dollars in raw materials for a product that they're assembling to send to a big customer like Walmart in the US. Okay? They've got all this money invested. Okay? Now suddenly it gets it goes into a product, then it gets shipped, and then the clock stops to, uh, ticking. That is, Walmart will pay 30 days after shipment or 45 days after shipment. And they've got to wait that long to get that money back, plus their little profit. And so trade financing for that gap. That's a big challenge. That's a risk of window. That's real. That's not in a textbook. That is less than 24 hours. I'm talking to someone yesterday, just across the border. Okay? You want to know what real truck, what the real challenges are? You need to interact with those companies and you'll grow much faster, especially whatever internship you're looking for. All right? So here's operationally what's going on. The challenge for this company was, well, we know operationally we've got that running like clockwork, but that doesn't stop the problem. We've got this risk where we've invested so much money in the raw materials, then we've got to pay the supplier, but we've got to wait 30 days or plus to get the money from the customer. That's a risk, but hopefully most of our customers are okay and they will pay, but there's money locked up for that one month. <coughs> and that costs money, right? And that's a risk. If a customer defaults, bang, you lose everything. Because you may not be able to sell, sell that product to anyone else, right? So that's uh, 24 hours dated information, <coughs> okay? Time driver. We're talking about time, right? Oh, there's a bank we know about, isn't it? Yes. My favourite bank, of course. 
And here we have a bank. And this is a, a real example for you to work through on time, working out. If you're promising customers how much waiting time, you've got so many, you've got one teller, the counter is open for five hours, 300 minutes each day, no time to go to the washroom. Uh, operating capacity, yes, 